Hello, everybody. I'm Spencer Mazik, and this is the Bloomberg Law Podcast. It's the sex abuse scandal that has left a university shaken. And now many are asking, how much did Penn State officials know about the allegations involving Jerry Sandusky? Joining me now to discuss the charges leveled against Penn State's administration is Marcy Hamilton, a law professor at Cardozo Law School and author of Justice Denied, What America Must Do to Protect Its Children. Welcome, Professor Hamilton. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us today. So as we all know, uh, Joe Paterno was fired. The university president was fired. But what's interesting is that no formal charges have been brought against either of them so far. Mm -hmm. So were they tried in the court of public opinion? And did the public find them guilty of failure <laughs> to do the right thing? Well, both of them were under an obligation. Well, let's start with Joe Paterno. He was under an obligation to report to his superior. That's all that Pennsylvania law required. He did what he was supposed to do. And so uh, he has not been charged with failure to report. With respect to the president of the university, he has not been charged. Uh, it, it's a little mysterious as to why he wouldn't be charged. But the two officials who have been charged from Penn State, both of them were charged on perjury counts as well as not reporting. Yes, and I mean, back to Joe Paterno, though, and the university yeah. president. Some people have described their actions here as an epic lapse in moral responsibility. Right. Would you agree with that? Well, it, it's a tremendous moral failure, but it is not uncommon in organizations where children are being sexually abused and it's an employee. You see this kind of cover-up. We've seen it in the Catholic Church. We've seen it in the Orthodox Jewish community. We've seen it in the Mormon Church. Across the culture, we see this. So this is the first time that we've seen it in a university setting. Okay, and so turning to the two university officials, like you said, who were charged with failure to report the sex abuse allegations there, Tim Curley and Gary Schultz, based on the grand jury report, what do we know about what they knew of the allegations? Well, they've been charged with perjury because what the grand jury report says is that they said they didn't know, actually, that it was a serious problem. They didn't know that it was sexual in nature. They tried various ways of saying it was just horseplay or messing around. And so nobody believed them, apparently. The grand jury, in its report, says they didn't find that credible, that they must have had more information based on what Joe Paterno had said to them. Okay. And so... The report also said that what they didn't do is they didn't actually, you know, alert the authorities, campus police or otherwise. They didn't identify the child. They didn't try to help the child. Right. So what did they do, if anything, here? Well, apparently nobody did anything directly to help any of these children. Uh, with respect to Joe Paterno, he was told about the assault. Uh, by that point, it was over and nobody knew who the 10-year-old child was. Uh, because there'd been no attempt to do anything immediately, like call 911. And so all he did was tell his superior. And then he went back to work. I mean, he handled it in a very bureaucratic fashion. Okay, so but with respect to Tim Curley and Gary Schultz, under the current Pennsylvania law, were they required to report any alleged child sex abuse by virtue of their positions as athletic director and senior vice president of finance and business? They did have obligations, but they're not crystal clear. What's crystal clear in Pennsylvania, and it's most states, is all K through 12 teachers must report, doctors must report. Uh, so anybody who is a professional has an obligation, uh, you know, anything they do with children, they have to report. Universities don't really have children uh, attending. And so right, right. it hasn't been clear to this point. I, I, I have no doubt this will be changed soon, but their obligation to report is shakier than it would have been had they been a high school teacher. When could they fit under the whole school administrator? I, I mean, I don't know. It's possible. Uh, you know, the, the law itself seems unclear enough that they might be encompassed by it. Uh, but we know for a fact that who did report in this case? The only entity, the, the only two people who reported in this case. It was the eyewitness, uh, McCrary? He reported to Joe Paterno. He did not, uh, didn't report to the police, right? Right, exactly. So uh, in 1998, a mother reported that her, her, her son was, his hair was wet. And she asked, what's wrong? And he said, oh, I took a shower with Sandusky. And she said, I don't like that. She reported it to Penn State University Police, and they did an investigation and closed it. So that report wasn't mandatory. It was just a mom calling the university where Sandusky worked. 
Then we had... In well, any idea why they closed the investigation No, there? no one okay. knows. And, and the odd thing there is that the district attorney working on it has disappeared, as has his hard drive to his computer. I heard that they also had uh, one police officer working on this investigation. I'm not sure if that was part of the reason, too. Yeah, we don't know exactly why that investigation was closed. It's not unusual for an original report about sex abuse by an individual to end up not being followed through. Uh, the police are often looking at the second, the third, the fifth report before they get really, really serious about these issues. Now, there was a report in 2008, and what's interesting is it was a mandated reporter. A mother called uh, a high school and said, my son has had inappropriate contact with Sandusky at your high school. That report was made to the police. Okay. And that's the reason we have this grand juror report. So both times it was a mom that started it, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but the mandated reporter in that second scenario was the high school, and then they reported. Then it fell apart. When it got into the university system, uh, no one in authority got any more information. And so, and back to Pennsylvania law for just a second. I know that under the current law, you said that it's not very clear, but some legal minds have also said that they might escape liability here because even this broad record, reporting requirement in the right. two wasn't enacted until 2007. The incident occurred in 2002. So, right. I mean, the language was even less clear in 2002. But would the spirit of the law come into play here, which I believe would be to mandate reporting? Well, I, I think the spirit of the law should uh, inform and expand reporting requirements as much as possible. But I think most states have not fully worked out who should be reporting adequately. And unfortunately, the only time you figure out when you've got a mistake is when it, you find out about sex abuse of a child that didn't get reported. So, I mean, the best thing we can say about this situation for those laws is that it's educational, that we are learning something. Right. Whether or not they'll be able to convict these two individuals, Curley and Schultz, on reporting, I think is iffy. But I think they probably do have a good case on perjury. And that is a huge problem for Yeah, them. and I want to talk about the perjury charges. But before we get to that, just one more question. <laughs> Could the relationship between the second mal charity, which was founded by Sandusky, and Penn State University, could that play a critical role in determining liability here? Well, I think what we're going to be seeing is joint and several liability. We're going to see both sides, uh, both the university and the charity, being capable of being civilly liable for uh, almost all of this activity. Uh, but with respect to criminal liability, uh, the second mile hasn't been named at all, and the university's only been named through these two individuals. So, and in, you mentioned the perjury charges here, and we also have the charge to uh, failure to report the sex abuse allegation. Of the two charges, which one carries more weight? Which is more serious in terms of sentencing? Uh, perjury uh, is okay, typically, why? well, for one thing, there's a strong incentive among lawmakers and uh, prosecutors to ensure that anybody who does come into contact with the authorities tells the truth. Right. Uh, and, you know, if, if there was nothing else any of us learned from Martha Stewart's travails, she really may not have done much wrong. But when you lie to the authorities, exactly, you're you don't get... win. Yeah, and she didn't win in that instance no, at all. No, and she went to jail for a year. These two individuals, they were in front of a grand jury. They should have just told the truth. Now, there'll be a trial to see if they told the truth or not. Right. It's only alleged that they perjured themselves. But given the rest of the testimony as it's written up in the report, I think they have a, a, a difficult case ahead of them. Okay, and so over the weekend, it's been reported that the alleged, the victims, they are contemplating civil actions here against Penn State University for failing to report the sex abuse right. allegations. I mean, do you think we're going to see them file these actions, or could the university possibly settle them, the claims before they actually go to right. trial? Well, as I understand, there's only one survivor so far who actually is a lawyer who is actively operating to perhaps file a civil, civil suit. Action, yeah. um, most civil attorneys engaged in this arena will wait for the criminal prosecution to go forward. Uh, you don't want to get in the way of the criminal prosecution because if a defendant is convicted, that evidence is extremely helpful in getting uh, a settlement or a winning a trial on the civil side. So most civil cases will stand back. They won't even be filed until that criminal action is taken care of. And so even if victims, and I assume they are, are calling lawyers and talking to them, uh, most good lawyers in this field will say, just wait, 
Let's see what happens on the criminal side, and then we'll talk about civil damages. Okay, and let's get to the statute of limitations for mm. everything that we've discussed <laughs> here, because we've talked about a lot. We talked about perjury, we talked about the failure to report, right. and then we've also talked about the civil actions. Can you just give me a quick rundown of what the statute of limitations are for each of those? Well, uh, like many states, Pennsylvania has this complicated scheme, because what they had was much too short statutes of limitations, and when they realized they had a mistake, they kept extending. And so it's my view, I've taken the view very publicly, that we should just eliminate statute of limitations on child sex abuse. But we're not there yet in Pennsylvania. Right, no, we're not. So uh, anyone who uh, was turned 20 before August of 2002, their claims are basically incapable of going forward. So that means if any of the victims then are over the age of 20, then they in, cannot bring a claim under Pennsylvania law for the right. failure to re re report the sex or, abuse or allegations. Or any other claim. Okay. Uh, so the child sex abuse claims are generally not permitted after that age. So it was a very short time, and uh, if you're 20 years old, then you're out. So uh, Second Mile was established, I believe, in 1977. Yes, it was. So, you know, abusers don't start in midlife. Uh, we can assume that uh, if all of these allegations turn out to be true, that there are victims going back before the statute of limitations that may well have expired. So there, there's this cadre of uh, victims all over the state of Pennsylvania who've been shut out. So that's the first barrier. Now, as of 2002, a victim would have up until the age of 30. Okay. If they're not 20 yet, to get up until 30 to file a civil claim. Okay. Which, as I understand, so that's a little bit more time there. It's then. a little bit more time. Most victims don't come forward until their 30s, 40s, 50s, so it's still short, but it's better. Now, with respect to the criminal claims, uh, as of 2005, that time deadline was extended to, to 50 years old. Oh, okay. So, but you still have this question of were they 20 this date, were they 30 this date, were right. they 50? But it's complicated. Of all the victims that I've seen described in this one report, it looks to me like most are within the statute of limitations pretty easily. Okay, so we'll see what happens then. Well. Thanks very much for sharing your insight with us today on a story that is tragic on so many levels. Thank you. Marcy Hamilton, a Cardozo Law School professor. For more information on this or other topics, log on now to BloombergLaw.com. Bye, everybody.